Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, very special event. Uh, I'm Professor Shane Hearn, a Noongar man from Western Australia, the Dean of Indigenous Research and Education Strategy at the University of Adelaide. And uh, I have the uh, privilege of being your MC for the 11th annual Luicia O'Donoghue oration. To start the formal proceedings, uh, I would like to uh, welcome Mickey O'Brien AO to perform the official welcome to country. Mickey O'Brien is a senior Aboriginal man. He is a descendant of the Ghana Aboriginal uh, Adelaide Plains and York Peninsula people. Mickey has been sharing cultural engagement for a number of years now. It is a role handed to him by his father, Yula Burka, Old Man of the Sea, a position he honours and respects greatly. Mickey is a foster parent to three beautiful young children and has travelled and worked all across Australia, particularly with Aboriginal communities. Today, he shares his cultural knowledge and welcome to country with us. Please welcome Mickey O'Brien. Naichaya, uh, Shane. Nina Mani. Ah, Naichaya. Minyana na Mani Puruji, Nai Nari Kamatbi Maracha, Nai Wangandi Mani Budni Gani Yatana, here in the Yatta, Tendananga. Yeah, welcome to Ghana country, and um, I want to acknowledge um, certainly our elders, and uh, particularly Ani Lawacha, who, uh, who we are here to, to hear and uh, be a part of this um, wonderful event. And, uh, but not just only Aloha, but, um, but many of our great elders who have uh, sadly passed, particularly in recent times, uh, only Alice, um, Aloha, uh, Rigney, and, um, and uh, previous to that, only Josie, and uh, great elders and great leaders and mentors for me as a, uh, as a, a young man growing up, uh, particularly in the Ghana culture. But this week is a special week. It's a week of reconciliation, and uh, where really we all come together to join. And, What's really uh, special about this is that uh, South Australia has, um, in its past, and hopefully its future, those uh, demonstrations of what reconciliation is about. Whether you look at the, the letters patent that uh, King William IV wrote, where he said that the Aboriginal people should be entitled to the land that they walked upon and should own that land. Or whether you look at uh, my great-great-great-grandmother, Canado, who was the, went to the native school to learn to read and write English and also married the first non-Aboriginal man and was given away by the Aboriginal protectors and also was uh, given, uh, got permission from the governor of the day. Or whether you look at the South Australian flag from 1876 to 1904, the flag just before the current flag, where it actually has on there an Aboriginal person and a person from the British Empire, a woman shaking the hand of the Aboriginal man. We also saw Sir Doug Nichols who was a governor of South Australia. Sadly, he got sick. And we've just seen in my chosen sport in football, the celebration of the Indigenous rounds and where people have certainly joined hands in, in acknowledging the Aboriginal people. And, and in some ways, that great game, we called it Pando, the Victorians called it Mungrook. What people don't know is that in some ways, those totems that go with those football teams, those jumpers that goes with those football teams, are actually come and derive from the, the Aboriginal people in when they dressed up in ceremony and put their markings on their bodies, just like I've done to my face today. And it's important to know that. But I want to give you a story. I want to give you a story about Minya Muni. Now, Minya Muni, he was a short man, but he was a strong man. He was very quick. But he also had an ambition. He wanted to be a great leader of our community. So he went to the great elders and he said to them, please honour me as the next greatest hunter like my brother before me. And so the great elders said to him, well, you need to do a number of things. And I want you to collect all the wood for this winter because this winter is going to be a bad winter. We need this wood for our fires to keep us warm. 
So Minyawuni collected that wood. He did it quicker than anybody else had done before him. He built it twice as high as anybody else before him. He then came back to the great elders and he said, see what I have done. Surely you can anoint me the honour of being a great leader or a hunter of our community. And they said to him, we want you to be the person who looks after collecting our wood for winter. Now, Minyamuni was saddened by this, and so he set fire to that wood. And sadly, he lost his life in that fire. But the great elders called out to the spirit people because they were saddened in losing Minyamuni, a, a person who could have been of greatness. And they called out to him, to the great spirits. And today, we still see Minyamuni before the rains, still collecting wood, quicker than anybody else, strong as anybody else. Do we know who he is? The ant. He is the ant. And so sometimes out of sadness comes greatness. And today we're going to hear, hopefully, the greatness of the wonderful people our elders have done in the work they've done in laying down the paths for us today as young people. So I want to say to you, Natu Yukandayu, Natu Yakandayu, Punya Du Wadu, I say to you, as brothers and sisters, let us continue to walk in harmony. Nay Chayu and enjoy this wonderful event. Thank you. Well thank you so much, Michael. I too would like to uh, acknowledge the our inescapable Indigenous culture and heritage. The foundations of this country are written on the landscape. The landscape of the country is marked with Indigenous culture. From North Terrace, Waite, Roseworthy, all of these places have an ancient history and this is all over the continent. We welcome, we come today here on the traditional lands of Ghana people. I acknowledge by respecting what is anchored in the past and what can be translated in the future. By remembering our past and planning our future together, I acknowledge past, present and future Ghana peoples. I respectfully acknowledge all First Peoples of this nation and neighbouring places. Before we start this evening's proceedings, I would like to cover some basic housekeeping. In the case of emergency, where we need to evacuate, please use the nearest emergency exit. The assembly point is Goodman Crescent Lawn, which is to my right, next to uh, the real William, Ride side, William Road side of the building. Toilets are located either side of the front foyer entrance. For those who require toilets with ramp access, these are located in the Napier building. We have security guards at the front of the building who will guide you and, and provide access to the building. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Luigi O'Donoghue, ACCBE DSG, who is here with us tonight, and we will have the privilege of hearing from her later on. And of course, our guest speaker for the evening, Father Frank Brennan, SJAO, and the Honourable Reverend Dr. Lynn Arnold, AO, former Premier, Chair of Trustees, Don Dunstan Foundation. I would like to acknowledge the University of Adelaide as our host this evening and welcome Rear Admiral, the Honourable Kevin Scars, former Governor of South Australia and Chancellor of the University of Adelaide and interim universe, uh, Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Mike Brooks. I would also like to welcome some of our special guests here tonight. Mr. Kyan Ma, MLC Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and Reconciliation, Helen Colony, Co-Chair of Reconciliation South Australia and recently appointed Commissioner for Children and Young People, Stephen Arndt, Principal Government Relations, Corporate Affairs, BHP Olympic Dam, Francis Bedford, MP and Mark Parnell, MLC. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr Nikki Vincent, Commissioner for Equal Opportunity, and Robin Layton, Chair of Justice Reinvestment South Australia. 
Now, before we uh, go any further, I would like to also acknowledge someone who can't be with us this evening, Dr. Alice Rigney. Dr. Rigney passed away on the 13th of May at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Alice was an elder and a matriarch of the Ghana and Narunga Aboriginal nations in South Australia icon. She was the first female Aboriginal school principal in Australia and founder of the first urban Aboriginal school, Ghana Plains. She was central to the implementation of the Ghana language curriculum in South Australia school syllabus and the national curriculum. She took on significant roles in South Australia's guardianship board and Aboriginal education training and advisory committee and nationally as ambassador for the Commonwealth Department of Education, Science and Training, National Indigenous English Literacy and Numeracy Strategy. Alice was one of the first few Aboriginal women to work in South Australia Department of Education and received the Public Service Medal for her outstanding contribution to the Aboriginal schooling. She taught over 5,000 Aboriginal students over her lifetime. She graduated from Delissa Institute, UniSA, and was later awarded an honorary U UniSA doctorate the same year as Nelson Mandela. She was appointed an Aboriginal Education Ambassador by Prime Minister Gillard, and I would like to offer my deepest condolences to all who knew and loved Alice throughout her lifetime. This year marks the 11th Loitia O'Donoghue Oration, which is one of the key events held as part of Reconciliation Week. This year's oration is particularly special as it also marks 50 years since the 1967 referendum. This annual event honours the resilience and influential Aboriginal leader, Dr. Loitia O'Donoghue. ACCBEDSG and gives a voice to issues of equality for our nation's first people. Tonight we will hear from Louisa herself, followed by Father Frank Brennan, who will deliver the, the main oration for the evening. We will conclude the evening by joining a community choir in singing freedom songs. You will all have a chance to sing along, and um, for those that don't know the words, the words are in your program. I would like to acknowledge the partners that have made tonight's event possible. The Don Dunstan Foundation, Reconciliation South Australia, University of Adelaide, the Government of South Australia and BHB Billiton. Can we give them all a round of applause, please? Now, I must say, I am very proud to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Luicia O'Donoghue. Luicia is an Aboriginal woman who has dedicated her life to improving the welfare of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. She has been named Australian of the Year twice and was the inaugural chairperson of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. She was the first Aboriginal woman to be inducted into the Order of Australia and as a commander of the Order of the British Empire. She was made a Companion of the Order of Australia in 1999. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Louisa O'Donoghue. Thank you for the welcome. Now, I'm putting people out a bit, but when I came here and I looked there, there was no way that I was going to get up those stairs and so on. So I tell you that uh, what I have to say is very so short and sweet, hopefully. Uh, so tonight, the contribution of Don Dunstan to be the advancement of Aboriginal people and his membership of FACATSI, 
For those of you who don't know what FOCATSI is, it was a federal council for the advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. In October 1958, Don Dunson drew up the petition signed by 7,000 people, resulting in the repeal of the obnoxious as consorting with Aborigines offence under the Police Offences Act. Don Dunstan was the third president of Fakatsi. Whilst he was shadow, South Australian shadow attorney general in the 1960s, he introduced the legislation for land rights in the APY lands. And for those people who know me well enough, know that that is my country. I'm a Yankundara woman from there, but removed, of course, as a child. But was unable to attend the official handover of the lands, a privilege undertaken by the Premier Tonkin, his Liberal successor. I loved Fukatsi. Made up as it was until the 1970s by both black and white people. Tonight, I pay tribute to Don Dunstan and the black and white people who made up membership of Fakatsi as unity was our strength. I'm asking you tonight to listen to Father Frank's oration and be guided by his wisdom. We shall overcome someday. Thank you. And hopefully you will all, at the end, get up and hold hands and sing along, We Shall Overcome Someday. Thank you. Well, thank you, Luigi, for sharing your wonderful insights. It's been a uh, personal privilege to um, have met you and get to know you through this process. And also, personally, I'd like to thank you for carving out the space so that um, the other Indigenous people of my generation can express themselves. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like us to move to the, the, the next part of the, the evening, and I would like now to introduce the keynote speaker for this evening, Father Frank Brennan. Father Frank is an Australian Jesuit priest, human rights lawyer and academic. Fa Frank is currently the CEO of the Catholic Social Services Australia. He is known for his 1998 involvement in the WIC debate when Paul Keating called him the meddling priest. And the National Trust classified him as a living national treasure. He has a long-standing reputation of advocacy in the areas of law, social justice, refugee protection, and Aboriginal reconciliation. He is an officer of the Order of Australia for services for Aboriginal Australians, particularly as an advocate in the areas of law, social justice and reconciliation. Tonight he will speak on the topic of Aboriginal land, seeking unity at the table. Please join me in welcoming Father Frank Brennan to the stage. Sahern, Mickey O'Brien, Loacher, ladies and gentlemen. I acknowledge the Kaurna people, the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region, and join you in paying our respects to all elders present. It's a great honour for an Australian without any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander heritage to be asked by Loacher O'Donoghue to deliver the Loacher oration 
marking the 50th anniversary of the 1967 referendum. It's also the 25th anniversary of the High Court's Mabo decision and the 20th anniversary of the first Reconciliation Convention held in Melbourne and chaired by Patrick Dodson. I was privileged to be the rapporteur at that convention. 50 years on from the successful 1967 referendum, we have all heard the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representatives have told us that in 1967 we were counted, in 2017 we seek to be heard. Australians of goodwill acknowledge that sovereignty is a spiritual notion for Indigenous Australians and that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander incarceration and separation of children are indicators of the torment of their powerlessness. We affirm the aspiration of the Indigenous leaders gathered at Uluru when they said, when we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. Indigenous leaders this last week have called for the creation of two new legal entities. They want a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution and a Makarata Commission set up by legislation. The Makarata Commission would supervise agreement making between governments and First Nations and engage in truth telling about history. The envisaged destination is a national Makarata or treaty. So the immediate constitutional issue is the creation of the First Nations voice. There is no point in proceeding with a referendum on a question which fails to win the approval of Indigenous Australia. Neither is there any point in proceeding with a referendum which is unlikely to win the approval of the voting public. The consultations conducted in Indigenous communities under the auspices of the Referendum Council have yielded a constant message that Indigenous Australians want substantive constitutional change and not just symbolic or minimalist change. The Referendum Council is required to report to the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition by the end of next month on options for a referendum proposal, steps for finalising a proposal and possible timing for a referendum. The Referendum Council needs to recommend to government a timetable for constitutional change with maximum prospects of a yes vote for proposals sought by Indigenous Australians. Australians will not vote for a constitutional First Nations voice until they have first heard it and seen it in action. The work needs to begin immediately on legislating for that First Nations voice so that it is operating as an integral part of national policy and lawmaking, attracting national support for constitutional recognition. Presumably, this new legislated entity would replace the existing National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, and I note the presence of Jackie Huggins here this evening. That Congress boasts as a company the Congress is owned and controlled by its membership and is independent of government. Together we will be leaders and advocates for recognising our status and rights as First Nations peoples in Australia. In my view, the Referendum Council should recommend that the government commence immediate consultations how best to set up a new Indigenous Advisory Council as a First Nations voice. It should recommend that Parliament legislate for the creation of such a council. It should recommend that any referendum be delayed until the Advisory Council is established and working well. 
The Parliament might then, and only then, consider legislation for a referendum proposing relevant changes to the Constitution. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull was right when he said on Saturday at the 50th anniversary of the 1967 referendum, no political deal, no cross-party compromise, no leader's handshake can deliver constitutional change. To do that, a constitutionally conservative nation must be persuaded that the proposed amendments respect the fundamental values of the Constitution and will deliver precise changes that are clearly understood to be for the benefit of all Australians. That will happen only once the proposed First Nations voice has been set up and been seen to be working well. One desirable change to the Constitution would be to Section 5126, which could be amended to provide that the Commonwealth Parliament have power to make laws with respect to the cultures, languages and heritage of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their continuing relationship with their traditional lands and waters. These are the distinctively Indigenous matters which warrant Indigenous peoples having a secure place at the table. Section 5126 of the Constitution could then go on to provide that the Parliament have power to make laws with respect to the constitution and functions of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Council, which may request the Parliament to enact a law or advise the Parliament of the effect of a law or proposed law relating to any of those distinctively Indigenous matters. Other issues will wait for another day or be dealt with outside the Australian Constitution. One thing is certain following last week's cry from the heart at Uluru. There is no quick fix to the Australian Constitution. Successful constitutional change acceptable to the Indigenous leaders gathered at Uluru won't be happening any time soon. We need to take the time to get this right. This evening, I will argue that a First Nations voice is more like a complex symphony with multiple conductors than a chamber choir under one conductor. I will explain why a racial non-discrimination clause is unachievable and unworkable in light of the High Court's development of the common law recognising native title. In any event, such a clause should be attempted only as part of a comprehensive constitutional bill of rights or as part of a non-discrimination clause addressing all key discrimination concerns in contemporary Australia. With respect, I think the Indigenous leadership were right to ditch that as a proposal for constitutional change in that I don't think it is achievable and I don't think it is workable. The removal of the race provisions and the addition of an acknowledgement could have been put to referendum fairly promptly if sought by Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. The constitutional recognition of a First Nations voice will take more time. A referendum is more likely to succeed if the First Nations voice is already in existence so that people know what they are voting for or against. I will add a note of well-intentioned caution as a white fella about the political risk and cost of deferring incremental constitutional change. With a slightly Irish touch, I will be suggesting that if I were setting out on a journey towards a Makarata between Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders and the Commonwealth and a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution, I would prefer to set out on my journey with a constitution which actually acknowledges Aboriginal history, present reality and future aspirations and which specifically empowers the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on such matters rather than setting out with a constitution that does not even mention Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. And if I were not setting out for those destinations, 
I would still prefer a constitution that actually mentions Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders and which specifies that the Commonwealth Parliament has power to make laws with respect to Indigenous Australians without having recourse to the generic term race. But let's be clear, there should be no incremental change to the Constitution unless that change is commended, supported and advocated by Indigenous leaders. So, having set the roadmap, might I make some acknowledgements. This evening's event is organised by Reconciliation South Australia and the Don Dunstan Foundation. I pay tribute to the late Don Dunstan. I met him only once, but it was in the best of circumstances. A group of us were camping out under the stars with him and Nugget Coombs in the Pitchetonjara lands while consulting on proposed reforms on the pitlands. We were all aware that we were in the presence of two of the all-time greats. Don entered the South Australian Parliament before I was born. Having witnessed the appalling living conditions for Aborigines living on the Port Pierce mission in the early 1950s, he was resolved to act. He got to know some young Aboriginal men here in Adelaide, including Charles Perkins and John Moriarty, who had lived at the St Francis home. He listened to them, he learned from them, and he provided them with hope and leadership. The Federal Council of Aboriginal Advancement, the FCAA, later named for Catsey, was established here in Adelaide in 1958. Sue Taff notes in Black and White Together, Lowich's preferred history of the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, the people at the Adelaide Conference were old and young, black and white, liberal and socialist. Nonetheless, they were connected by a common view. They agreed that the repeal of restrictive laws would allow Aboriginal Australians to join the Australian community as citizens. They were moved by a common drive to pressure apathetic governments and electorates to take greater responsibility for Aboriginal Australians. They would travel together for the next 15 years, not always harmoniously, but on the whole accepting the good intentions of those with whom they differed. Don Dunstan became involved and was to be the last white president of the council in 1960, paving the way for Joe McGuinness to take over at the Brisbane conference in 1961. Joe remained president of Fikatsi until 1973. I was privileged to meet him a few times in Cairns when I was legal advisor to the Queensland Aboriginal Coordinating Council. Joe had been a wharfie, he'd worked for the Cairns Council, he worked for the newly established Commonwealth Department of Aboriginal Affairs and was then a leader of Aboriginal hostels in North Queensland. Together with the legendary Clary Grogan, he was very welcoming of the new young Catholic whitefella on the block. Don Dunstan became a minister in the new Labor government here in 1965, and by 1966 he had succeeded in having the South Australian Parliament pass the first law instituting an Aboriginal land trust and the first Aboriginal law prohibiting racial discrimination. He withdrew from Fikatsi, later telling Peter Reid, they didn't need Europeans sitting around doing a sort of hand-holding job that we should be in the background helping. I note the presence this evening of Dawn Casey and Kerry Tim, two extraordinary Aboriginal women who have contributed so much to the well-being of their people and to the Commonwealth of our nation through public service to governments of all political persuasions. I'm greatly honoured that each of them has travelled from the East to be here. They were to be accompanied by Patricia Turner, but she needs to be at Parliament House first thing in the morning to represent her mob in discussions with some of our elected politicians. We have supported each other through many political battles in the past. I particularly thank Pat Turner for writing the foreword to my book, No Small Change, and I acknowledge Lowich's successor as chair of ATSIC, the late Garchul Jakura, 
who courageously and generously launched my book, The Wick Debate, during the difficult aftermath of the acrimonious 1998 native title debate. I also note the presence of Father Brian McCoy, the provincial of the Jesuits here in Australia. He's my boss. He worked for many years with Aboriginal people, from Palm Island in Queensland to Balgo in the Kimberley. He worked for Patrick Dodson on the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Brian and I take pride in our Jesuit predecessors like Donald MacKillop, the brother of the now canonised St Mary MacKillop. Donald MacKillop ministered amongst the Aborigines of the Daly River in the Northern Territory at the end of the 19th century and wrote one of the great letters to the editor when he sent his 1892 Christmas epistle to the Sydney Herald. This is what he wrote. Australia, as such, does not recognise the right of the black man to live. She marches onward, truly, but not perhaps the fair maiden we paint her. The black fellow sees blood on that noble forehead, callous cruelty in her heart, her heel is of iron, and his helpless countrymen beneath her feet. I also note the presence of my sister, Madeline Brennan QC, a member of the Queensland Bar. I should note that she and her husband occupy chambers in Brisbane known as Roma Mitchell Chambers. And I note that with great pride because the last time I was speaking here in Benython Hall, it was in the presence and company of one Dame Roma Mitchell. And at the end of the evening's proceedings, she walked me down North Terrace and showed me her statue. <laughs> and I turned to her and said, well, Roma, once they've made a statue of you, there isn't really much left to do, is there? <laughs> she agreed, and she did die a very short time later, I have to say. <laughs> Madeline and I share considerable familial pride that the lead judgment in Marbo was penned by our father 25 years ago. As a barrister, Gerard Brennan had served as senior counsel for the Northern Land Council during the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Land Rights, set up by the Whitlam Government and chaired by Sir Edward Woodward. Prior to Marbo, he'd spent a decade on the High Court delivering numerous judgments on the interpretation of the Northern Territory Land Rights legislation. When Prime Minister Paul Keating rose in the House of Representatives to move the second reading of the Native Title Bill, on the 16th of November 1993, he commenced with these words. Today is a milestone, a response to another milestone, the High Court's decision in the Mabo case. The High Court has determined that Australian law should not, as Justice Brennan said, be frozen in an era of racial discrimination. Its decision in the Mabo case ended the pernicious legal deceit of terra nullius for all of Australia and for all time. When Chief Justice of Australia, Sir Gerard told an international audience of judges in Canada, the modern development of Australian law governing Aboriginal title to land is part of that post-colonial jurisprudence that's been developed in other countries to protect the relationship between the descendants of the indigenous inhabitants and their traditional lands. The post-colonial relationship of the indigenous population with their traditional land is not only or even chiefly a problem for the courts, but the courts, sensitive to the demands of justice for minorities and the disadvantaged in society, are likely to remain a forum in which indigenous peoples will seek to right what are now perceived to be historic wrongs. Fred Cheney, a former Minister for Aboriginal Affairs in pre-Mabo Australia and later Deputy President of the National Native Title Tribunal, has recently said, Mabo has transformed the status of Aboriginal people from perpetual mendicants to stakeholders. Mabo and the Native Title Act represent the biggest single shift in the power equation since 1788. Finally, I pay tribute, of course, to Loacher O'Donoghue, who personally invited me to deliver this oration. I've been privileged to work with Loacher and to be inspired by her over many decades. 
particularly when she chaired ATSIC and led the team which negotiated the Native Title Bill with Prime Minister Paul Keating in 1993. There have been many times when Locha, Pat Turner and I have turned to each other seeking the way to enhance the place at the table for Indigenous Australians. I thank Locha for her national leadership, for her trust, for her hopeful example and for her friendship. On this 50th anniversary of the 1967 referendum, it's appropriate to recall the years of hard labour put in by those Australians who contributed to Fikatsi and its predecessors. This evening, that's best done looking through the prism of Loach's early political involvements. Having left the Colebrook home, she first became involved with the Aboriginal Advancement League here in South Australia because it was the only organisation working for Aboriginal rights at the time. Moacher recalls that there were many white people from the churches involved. She would take Thursdays off and meet up with like-minded people near what is now Rundle Mall. Looking back on those days, she recalls a strict religious upbringing so that even going to the cinema was not well regarded. She was sent to the country to work after her 16th birthday. She observes, I'm not a radical, but I certainly wasn't to be walked over. When she took up nursing as a career, she had less time to dedicate to the Advancement League. But on her return from India in 1962, she got involved with the Aborigines Progress Association. The APA was affiliated with Fikatsi. Loacher used to travel to Canberra for the annual Easter conference. One attraction of the APA, in contrast to the Advancement League, was that the executive positions were held by Aborigines. Loacher then found a more natural home in the newly established Aboriginal Women's Council. She was the first secretary. She found her political voice, working locally with these fledgling Indigenous organisations in South Australia and participating in the annual Fikatsi meeting at which Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians worked together. Their great achievement was harnessing support for the 1967 constitutional referendum. This involved sustained effort over many years with close collaboration of Indigenous and non-Indigenous leaders representing many varied communities and sectors of society. Their efforts were awarded with the highest yes vote ever in a referendum campaign. And I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Once the referendum was carried, Fikatsi splintered, culminating in the 1970 meeting at which Aboriginal members walked out and established their own National Tribal Council. Barry Pittock, a Quaker scientist who had some exposure to the American approach to Indigenous affairs, was very involved with Fikatsi and by 1970 was one of the non-Indigenous members supportive of Aboriginal desires to be self-determining. He proposed the amendment to the Fikatsi Constitution that all executive members be of Australian Aborigine or island descent with a power to co-op members irrespective of racial descent. The meeting was a fiasco, resulting in a vote of 48 to 48, whereupon Pastor Doug Nichols and Kath Walker called on those supporting the amendment to gather on one side of the hall. They immediately resolved to form an interim body controlled by Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. This became the National Tribal Council. Reflecting on the conference, Pittock wrote, the 1970 Easter Conference of Fikatsi showed that a lot of white Australians, often sincere and dedicated, believe they know what is best for Aborigines, better than Aborigines themselves. For the sake of Aboriginal advancement, let us hope they will listen more closely in the future and think again. The National Tribal Council wants, needs and welcomes genuine friends and allies but not people who attach conditions to their friendship or who believe that they have the right to dictate solutions to other people's problems. 
Contemplating constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians five decades later, we are all needing to respect the place of Indigenous Australians in the complex processes of constitutional change, given that the amendment process of our constitution is one of the most democratic on earth, requiring not just the vote of both houses of parliament, but also the vote of the majority of voters nationally, as well as in four of the six states. We have only amended our constitution eight times out of 44 attempts. Australians are very cautious about constitutional change. No voter under 58 years of age has ever voted for a successful change to our constitution. No voter under 71 years of age had the opportunity to vote for the 1967 referendum. I have previously expressed my views on how Indigenous recognition might best be achieved, but I come this evening willing to listen more closely in future and think again in light of the ongoing deliberations by Indigenous Australians. I am one of those non-Indigenous Australians wanting to respond to last week's invitation at Uluru to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. And so I come to one last acknowledgement and I salute Pat Anderson, the chair of the Don Dunstan Foundation and the co-chair of the Referendum Council appointed by the Turnbull government to propose a way forward on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. Last week, Pat oversaw the National Constitutional Convention of Indigenous Leaders gathered at Uluru, the culmination of 12 consultations with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians conducted by the Indigenous members of the Referendum Council. Pat's co-chair of the Referendum Council, Mark Liebler, told the Q&A program a few weeks ago, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have only now completed 12 dialogues. They were not formulated or devised by me or by the non-Indigenous people sitting on the Council. They were designed by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representatives on the Council. They needed that time. They needed to consult widely. This is an absolutely unique phenomenon. This is the first time that we've had this sort of thing actually designed by and culturally acceptable to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Now that the National Convention of Indigenous Leaders at Uluru is complete, it's for the Referendum Council to consider the Uluru Report, which is the culmination of those dialogues. And it's for all of us to heed Pat Anderson's call. Australia has to hear us, for goodness sake. How many times do we have to tell you? Last night on the Q&A program, Pat told us that it's now time to put meat on the bones. With her gentle but firm wisdom, Pat observed that there has to be truth-telling and there might be a bit of bloodletting. So, let's look to the way forward. This is a critical time for all Australians who are seeking the due place for Indigenous Australians at the table, acknowledging that we are all and always will be on Aboriginal land, which is shared with all who call Australia home. I am particularly appreciative of this invitation, knowing that a couple of past Loacher orators have had cause to criticise me in my role over the years as the meddling priest, as Paul Keating once described me. I make no claim to infallibility, only to having an unswerving commitment to seeking a place at the table for the first Australians. On the 27th of May, 1967, 50 years ago last Saturday, Australians voted overwhelmingly to amend our constitution, deleting the two adverse references to Aborigines in the nation's founding document. The amendments were seen at the time to be modest and largely symbolic. Ironically, one result of the successful referendum was that the Australian constitution would no longer mention Aborigines. One amendment gave the Commonwealth Parliament power to make laws with respect to Aborigines, just as it had always given the Commonwealth Parliament power to make laws with respect to the people of any other race for whom it was deemed necessary to make special laws. 
Given the white Australia policy and the discriminatory policies visited upon Kanaka cane farmers in Queensland and Chinese miners on the gold fields, it was always expected prior to the 1967 referendum that this special Commonwealth race power would be exercised adverse to the interests and liberties of the targeted race. Given the way the 1967 referendum was conducted, it was assumed that this special Commonwealth race power would be exercised for the benefit of Aborigines, if at all. Mind you, Prime Minister Robert Menzies, who was a good constitutional lawyer and no great fan of this amendment, had always warned that the power could be exercised adverse to the interests of Aborigines. Prime Minister Harold Holt was surprised by the overwhelming vote in support of the amendments and was prompted into action by this expression of the popular will. He appointed a three-member council for Aboriginal affairs chaired by Nugget Coombs. These three wise white men, as they became known, Coombs, the great Professor W.E.H. Stanner and Barry Dexter, were instrumental in transforming a modest symbolic constitutional change into a lever for substantive policy change and legal reform. Looking back on their achievements in the light of the present debate about Indigenous recognition in the Constitution, I then published my book, No Small Change. In that book, I argued that it was time to learn the real lessons that followed from the 1967 referendum. That referendum contained proposals which nowadays would be called symbolic rather than substantive. It is and remains my contention that the modest constitutional changes contributed to substantive policy change. They kick-started the changes from terra nullius to land rights and from assimilation to self-determination. Prime Minister Holt appreciated that a modest referendum carried overwhelmingly provided the political mandate for policy changes. The catalyst for change was the Council for Aboriginal Affairs, which he then set up to advise government and to engage daily with public servants and politicians when considering policy and administrative changes. Any modern equivalent would not restrict its membership to three wise white men, even of the eminence of Coombe, Stanner and Dexter. Aboriginal Australians are entitled to their place at the table especially when it comes to decisions about their lands and cultures and social policies which single them out for special treatment or which impact on them more heavily and more often than other Australians. One of the difficult decisions which has confronted Indigenous Australians has been whether or not to cling to the recommendation made by the expert panel in 2012 that there should be a provision put into our constitution prohibiting racial discrimination. On the board, you see what was proposed by that expert panel. It was a simple provision. The Commonwealth, a state or a territory shall not discriminate on the grounds of race, color, or ethnic or national origin. As I've said, I think the indigenous leaders were wise to say that this was unachievable. And I think this evening I should give a brief explanation as to why it is unachievable. You'll note that this proposed prohibition in our constitution, which does not contain a Bill of Rights, relates only to racial discrimination. And so, if we were to have a referendum campaign, I dare say the question would arise. Why would you constitutionalise a ban on racial discrimination and not on sexual discrimination? or on religion, or on gender, or on other issues? Why, in the 21st century, would you seize only upon one criterion, namely race? But there are actually some fundamental problems in relation to the racial discrimination clause in the light, strangely, of what's occurred with the development of our jurisprudence, first in the Mabo decision, then the WIC decision, and the Native Title Act of 1993, and the Native Title Act of 1998. 
Suffice to say that both in 1993 and 1998, when many of us were there around the corridors of Parliament, when the native title bills came to the Senate each time, the minor parties, the Democrats and the Greens, proposed a clause be placed in the Native Title Act to say that the Native Title Act was strictly subject to the Racial Discrimination Act. And each time, the Liberal and National parties said no, and each time, the Labor Party said no. The Labor Party said no when in government in 1993, and the Labor Party said no when in government in 1998. Now, the reason for that lies in the third subclause of Section 7 of the Native Title Act, which you see there, that subsections 1 and 2 do not affect the validation of past acts or immediate period acts in accordance with this act. Suffice to say that the difficult compromise which was effected was to guarantee minors and pastoralists of the certainty of their titles so that we could move forward together. Those titles would be rendered uncertain if the Native Title Act was made strictly subject to the Racial Discrimination Act, and therefore they would be rendered uncertain if such a clause was put into our Constitution. The final point to note is that what we have at the moment as a result of the development of the common law of native title is that our Commonwealth Parliament has the power to suspend the operation of the Racial Discrimination Act when it is judged necessary to do so. And when it does so, it suspends its operation not only in relation to the Commonwealth, but also in relation to the states. Well, I think I've said enough to indicate that it's very complex, isn't it? And the thought of putting that through a referendum proposal in Australia with the contemporary state of our politics, I think is completely unachievable. And therefore, I think our Indigenous leaders were correct to forego a consideration of a racial discrimination clause. One final observation to make is that the question arises whether a racial discrimination clause in the Constitution would have exactly the same effect as the Racial Discrimination Act. Well, there's no lawyer who can tell you that indeed it would. We just don't know. In part, that's because the key provisions of the Racial Discrimination Act don't actually use the words discriminate or discrimination, and they refer to a catalogue of rights which are listed in the International Covenant against the elimination of discrimination. And suffice to say that we wouldn't have a constitutional provision that referred to a list of rights in an international convention. So I think that our Indigenous leaders are to be congratulated for their courage for putting the racial discrimination clause to one side, even though practically it has a very great appeal to all of us to say you would not want to discriminate on the basis of race in contemporary Australia. So now, might I come to consider more substantively the question of what a national voice might look like? And I want to suggest this evening that it's more like a symphony in three movements, a First Nations voice or a First Nations symphony under numerous conductors. And I want to look briefly at three movements in history. First, the negotiations of the Native Title Bill in 1993. You will recall that the Lowitcher O'Donoghue Orator for 2011 was none other than the great P.J. Keating. And he paid great tribute, as he should have, to Lowitcher O'Donoghue. And he paid that tribute in these terms. He said, had Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders not stepped up to the plate, the substance and equity of the subsequent Native Title Act may never have materialized. In an instant, I was struck by the opportunity of the High Court decision and was determined to not see it slaked away in legislative neglect. But determined as I was, I needed the partnership with Indigenous leaders to get it done and to get it done fairly. 
and this was Lowitch's finest hour. As the chair of ATSIC, she had the opportunity to bring a group of key Indigenous leaders into the tent. But the principal point I want to make this evening is that the negotiating party was not ATSIC. ATSIC, if you like, was the facilitator. It was the hub. It was the gateway. Lowitcher, as the chair of ATSIC, was able to facilitate bringing to the table a collective of Indigenous leaders from around the country, particularly those who had particular interests in the legislation that had to be considered. Now, things did get very hairy. By Black Friday on the 8th of October 1993, Paul Keating said, I am not sure whether Indigenous leaders can ever psychologically make a change to decide to come into a process, be part of it, and take the burdens of responsibility which go with it. But under Lowitch's leadership, that was done 10 days later on what was called Ruby Tuesday. A further point has to be acknowledged in relation to 1993. What happened under Lowitch's leadership was that negotiations were affected at the cabinet table between ministers in the Keating government and a group that came to be known as the A-Team. As I once said to his face, to Paul Keating, he was very lucky he didn't control the Senate because if he'd controlled the Senate, there would have been a view abroad that basically a deal had been done behind closed doors by Mr Keating and a self-selecting group of Aboriginal leaders. But because he didn't control the Senate, there emerged a second group called the B Team. And the B Team, they were going to improve on the A Team. And their politics was very different from the A Team. And it resulted finally that everyone in the B team, including Michael Mansell from Tasmania, was able to give the legislation the tick. And so the political process is complex. The political process required Aboriginal people to be there at the table holding trump cards. And they did every inch of the way. And they did in part because Paul Keating did not control the Senate. So the one question I raise about a First Nations voice is how would that voice actually operate in a situation like 1993? That voice would not be the principal negotiating party necessarily. Like Lowitcher and Atsic in 1993, it may simply have to be the gateway, the hub or the facilitator. Let me come to the second movement, some would regard, of course, as a much sadder movement, and that was in 1998. There's been much criticism of the way that Senator Brian Harradine in 1998 secretly negotiated the final compromise on native title with John Howard after the government had twice rejected Senate amendments to Mr Howard's bill. What you had at that time was a situation, a government that was hostile to Aboriginal Australia, wanted significant amendments to the Native Title Act and was dealing with the outcome of the WIC debate. There was a National Indigenous Working Group with their own legal team. They went to Senator Haradine under cover of night and said, this is the principal plank that we would put forward. You might want to make it part of a compromise that you seek to effect with Prime Minister Howard. Haradine dealt with Howard at some length there were two Senate debates, and each time Howard refused to sign off on the deal. Haradine at one stage said to me, I've been talking to the wrong fellow. I said, what do you mean? You've been talking to the Prime Minister. He said, the Prime Minister doesn't have the authority to sign off on this. He's got to get the permission of the Premier's court and Borbage from Western Australia and Queensland. Queensland then held an election. Mr Borbage lost the election. But more to the point, Pauline Hanson won 11 seats in the Queensland Parliament. Haradine was a very wily politician. He said, John Howard now will not risk a double dissolution election because unlike Malcolm Turnbull, John Howard was a very, very experienced politician. He said, if I risk a double dissolution election, Hanson will be there in the Senate in spades. 
Furthermore, Haradine said, Borbidge is no longer there. So he went back in and he cut the deal. Now, there were Aboriginal Australians who were and still are very upset by what Haradine did. Haradine said at the time, when he apologised publicly to Aborigines for having to act in secret, he said, I was concerned that if others were involved, there might be leaks and the horses might be frightened and they'd bolt. Garchul Jakura courageously acknowledged that the deal was an advance on the government's original bill. He said, we suspect Senator Haradine has taken the Prime Minister as far as he could to avoid a race-based election. I think he's demonstrated courage and integrity throughout this debate. I don't see how the consultation process or the ultimate legislation could have been improved at that time if ATSIC had been established by legislation envisaged specifically by the Constitution rather than by legislation without any mention in the Constitution of an Indigenous advisory body. That's one reason I have regarded the insertion of a constitutional provision for an advisory body as more symbolic and minimal than real and substantive. You will recall that the objects of the ATSIC Act stated that it was to ensure maximum participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the formulation and implementation of government policies that affect them. But on this, once again, I defer to the Indigenous groups who think there would be a real value add with such a constitutional provision. I remain wary that the addition of such a provision may make any referendum less appealing to the general voting public. But these prudential calls are not mine to make. I can only offer well-intentioned observations. We have all heard loud and clear the Uluru call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. So the third movement. I refer now to a contemporary situation in the Australian Parliament. I think all of us as Australians should take great pride that our Parliament now includes such extraordinary members as Patrick Dodson, as Mr Wyatt, a minister there in the Turnbull government, as Linda Burney, as Malandiri McCarthy. In recent times, Indigenous participation in the lawmaking processes of Parliament have been enhanced by the presence in Parliament of Indigenous members of both houses and on both sides of the aisle. Consider the present debate about the Native Title Act amendments to the provisions relating to Indigenous land use agreements. What we've seen there, particularly under the leadership of Senator Patrick Dodson, is an indication to the Parliament that there will be no agreement to amendments until all key Aboriginal persons are called to the table. So once again, it's not in terms of saying we would be satisfied simply to deal with one Aboriginal voice. To quote him in the Parliament the other day, I personally met with representatives of native title claimants groups across Australia, and I've listened to their issues, their concerns, and their hopes. Aboriginal people have a right to object if they believe their native title is at risk, especially by extinguishment, and they should be heard. Importantly, Labor has blocked the government's attempt to give unfettered power over Indigenous land use agreements. We've insisted on amendments that make sure that control rests with native title holders, not politicians in Canberra. This is about respecting the decisions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and giving certainty to the agreements that native title holders have entered into. These views on complex legal and policy issues can be sought without being channeled through one Indigenous advisory body. But such a body might play a useful coordinating role. Perhaps the way forward is to set up a parliamentary joint committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island affairs, which would develop a working relationship with the peak Aboriginal and Islander advisory bodies. So, to conclude,
In recent times, Noel Pearson, in part following the lead of Tony Abbott, has suggested that if there were to be some acknowledgement in the Constitution, and it's an open question whether they would favour that, but if there were, that it should be some form of words which, in a sense, gave something to everybody in contemporary Australia. So let me share with you this evening what I think might be such a formula of words to consider. We, the people of Australia, include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and peoples from all continents who have made Australia home, having migrated to be part of a free and open society. We recognise that the continent and the islands of Australia were first occupied by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We acknowledge the continuing relationship Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with their traditional lands and waters. We acknowledge and respect the continuing cultures, languages and heritage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We acknowledge the foundation of modern Australia through British and Irish settlement and the establishment of parliamentary democracy, institutions and laws. We espouse respect, freedom and equality under the law for each other. I would then suggest we could consider an amendment to section 5126 of the Commonwealth Constitution, which would provide, oh, we've lost the slideshow. Um, yes. That the Commonwealth Parliament shall, subject to the Constitution, have powers to make law for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth with respect to the cultures, languages and heritage of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their continuing relationship with their traditional lands and waters. And the Constitution and functions of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Council which may request the Parliament to enact a law or advise the Parliament of the effect of a law or proposed law relating to any of these matters. So, as we wait for the institution of a national voice, I suggest the other matter for consideration as we go forward is whether or not it would be best at this stage to incrementally amend our constitution in a way which admittedly would be said to be largely symbolic and minimalist, but which would include Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders in the constitution, at the same time as we legislated for a one voice mechanism with a view to then constitutionalizing that down the track. And on all of this, I suggest Lowerture we still need your leadership, inspiration and experience. You are the only Aboriginal Australian to have worked closely with our present Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull when he was full of idealism for constitutional change as chair of Paul Keating's Republican Advisory Committee back in 1993. As a member of that committee, you recommended a constitutional preamble recognising your people and you convinced Mr Turnbull to back it. In the wake of the Uluru Declaration, I think you have one more national task to perform, Lowerture. <laughs> After the 2015 Lowerture oration delivered by Marcia Langton, you compared the situation in 1967 with the contemporary situation. You said, there was a different movement to what it is now. The only way I can explain it is that black and white were together, working towards the path of referendum. I think there's another element to it now because I think there are activists out there who want things to happen before the referendum. They're really more keen about getting action now and not waiting until what hopefully is a successful referendum. At the beginning I had confidence, but we don't have the unity and we have to get the unity. Lowerture. Bring us together behind a proposal for constitutional recognition that is both achievable and principled. Providing constitutional recognition of a First Nations voice 
on distinctively Aboriginal policy issues, while leaving open the future extra-constitutional question of a Makarata following upon a Makarata Commission. Together in the spirit of the pre-1970 Fikatsi members, we might join hands and sing together the freedom songs, committing ourselves to the unfinished business of the 1967 referendum, recalling last week's Uluru statement from the heart that in 1967 we were counted, in 2017 we seek to be heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me again and thank Frank for such an intriguing and thought-provoking. <laughs> Can I now invite the Honourable Reverend Dr Lynn Arnold, former Premier and Chair of Trustees Don Dustin, to provide us with a word of thanks to tonight's wonderful uh, speakers. Thank you very much, Shane, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Frank, for a, uh, a very impressive tour de force, indeed, uh, oration tonight. Um, the way you have brought together so many different themes over the history of uh, Australia's relationship with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, has been itself uh, a marvel. You've used the reference to uh, what would a national voice might look like. And indeed, the word that kept coming through in your oration tonight was the idea of a voice and the consequent requirement that we listen rather than presume. Indeed, you made the, cap the statement at the very start that, uh, that much of what has happened previously has been the presumption by the uh, powers that be in Australia of the right to dictate solutions to other people's problems. And you made a number of references to how that has looked over time. And then made the reference that what needs to happen now is that there needs to be a national voice. And indeed, the Uluru Statement is precisely such a declaration of a voice. And in that context, you use the idea of a, a symphony. Um, and I was quite taken by it, that it would be a complex symphony of multiple conductors, not a chamber group. Um, and then you took us through three movements of the symp uh, symphony that it might be. And I was struck by the fact that your first movement, the 1993 Native Title Act uh, movement, it might be called, really had those elements of Beethoven's Third Symphony, the Eroica, where there was this heroic, uh, wonderful, stirring and warm feeling that, yes, we were now about to draw together themes that had been for so long overlooked. You had made reference to the fact, for example, that the Mabo decision uh, of uh, that year was the biggest single shift in the power equation in this country since 1788. Um, and indeed, that is well worth thinking about just how significant that was. So it was an eroica. But then you take it to uh, 1998 with the, uh, the amendments to the Native Title Act. And I was more feeling at that stage that it was something of Rachmaninoff's uh, very complex uh, pieces that are very difficult and almost uh, discordant. And at that point, perhaps, one wonders if this is going to be something like Schubert's Unfinished. Um, and indeed, it is still an unfinished symphony to that extent, but you take us to the third movement. Uh, and at that stage, when you're talking about the indigenous participation in parliament, for example, not only in the national parliament, but of course in the parliaments of Australia, the various state and territory parliaments, and it's uh, a great pleasure to have uh, Kaya Ma here uh, in, uh, this evening from the South Australian parliament. Um, and at that stage, I started to feel Beethoven's Ninth, the Ode to Joy, was coming through uh, in this issue. But you have, in the process of doing that, challenged all of us to work out 
how indeed the process of change happens. Um, and you, I felt, gave a very interesting analysis of this tension between whether modest change or radical change, how does one make a difference between them? Um, and uh, you, you walked the, the, the line of analysis in a very interesting way. You uh, took us back in your review of history to exactly what was going on in 1967 and in the immediate aftermath to that. And you referred to the fact that what was seen to be modest changes in that referendum did lead to a mandate for change. And I think in that context then, you're inviting the same situation to happen now, that there could be um, more modest proposals that would lead for mandate for substantive change. And indeed, I heard you suggest further constitutional change down the track. One would hope, however, that it would not be a further 50 years uh, for that uh, process uh, to happen. But the key issue was how does change get authored? And the reference of the three white wise men of uh, 19, albeit well respected, nevertheless became a very powerful symbol that needs to be closely examined and moved away from. And this suggestion that the Makarata brings to the table in your title, um, speaking, seeking unity at the table, really says that all should be at that table. And the presumption that the decisions uh, could be made by others is something that should leave us feeling very abashed, that that's the way we saw things for so long. And indeed, therefore, the changes the, uh, that have been happening in recent times, Pat Anderson's comment, Australians have to hear us. And the issue of truth-telling, truth-telling can only come by those who actually know what the circumstances meant for them, not by others narrating that story on their behalf. And so the process of the 12 dialogues and all of that that comes through in that become very significant indeed. So I, uh, for one, and I'm certain I speak for everyone here tonight, uh, really have appreciated your oration tonight. You, I believe, have picked up the, um, the power and energy that Lowitcher has represented through all these years, and your invitation to Lowitcher to still carry on the fight uh, in terms of those change processes. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in thanking uh, Frank Brennan for his oration tonight. I have just a few other uh, thanks to also give uh, this evening. Uh, Michael O'Brien, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting and uh, useful, helpful um, welcome to country this evening and the way in which you put that together. It itself was uh, a very telling uh, oration and um, uh, so thank you very much for that. We think of course, this is not a thanks, but we think of course of uh, Alice Rigney, Dr. Alice Rigney and her passing and the significant role that she played in South Australia. And I know that next week there will be that special um, celebration of her life to be held in this very place. Lowitcher, it is always a pleasure to see you. Your role as a human being, as a, as a, as a person, as, as somebody influential in Australia, but just as somebody so concerned for humanity in the wider picture has touched us all. And the fact that it, uh, Frank could relate tonight how you have been so significant over so many years, um, you just keep on being in there. And so it is always a privilege to come and be able to speak at this occasion because you are the person after whom it is named. I have some other thanks also, the University of Adelaide for their support tonight um, and uh, the ongoing, uh, for their ongoing support for the Don Dunstan Foundation. Um, Flinders University likewise for their support. 
to BHP. And Stephen Arndt, thank you very much for being here on behalf of BHP Billiton and sponsoring this occasion. Mark Waters uh, and the, uh, the whole Reconciliation SA team and the Don Dunstan Foundation staff, um, uh, particularly uh, Rebecca, Colleen, um, also the, uh, of course, David, the new executive director, uh, Kathy King, chair of the uh, management team of the Don Dunstan Foundation as well. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here this evening because we are invited by Frank in his oration to take a message out into the community that changes the way we might help see the lead up to this next constitutional change. That it is a recognition that we must listen rather than presume. It is a recognition that a voice demands to be heard and the voice will be a complex symphony of multiple conductors, but in the end, it will take us to an ode to joy. Advertisement. The Marbo film screening this Saturday, flyers were put on your seats. I encourage you to, uh, uh, to look at those uh, flyers and to come this coming Saturday to that event. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I have a, a couple of gifts that I'd like to hand to our presenters tonight. We now come to the uh, interactive part of tonight. So uh, I would like to welcome uh, our singers. The Freedom Songs will be led by uh, Grayson Watama, Rotama, who um, has um, what I consider to be one of the friendliest smiles at the University of Adelaide. Grayson is a, a singer, musician, lecturer at the University of Adelaide Centre for Aboriginal Studies in Music. Uh, Anaya Jara singer and songwriter, Von der Last. Eddie Peters, a Torres Strait Islander musician, singer and songwriter. Mark Waters, State Manager of Reconciliation South Australia. Now you're all welcome to join the singers on stage or from your seats, you can sing loud. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, the words are on the program today. Before, they, uh, before you guys get started, I'd just like to thank everyone for your company tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure to be your MC tonight. Thank you both to our speakers that you're wonderful in terms of what you uh, shared with us tonight. Please also, another commercial break, <laughs> please also join the Don Dunstan Foundation and Reconciliation South Australia's free screening of Marbo this Saturday. More information is on the front cover of your seat. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your evening. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. You can stand. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. Mi corar perare, mi corar perare, mi corar pe wa tergerge, muy 
karaner ke ka ka umele mi korar pera wa der ger ger I want to hear you now <laughs> we, we, we shall live in peace we shall live in peace we shall live in peace someday oh deep in my heart i do believe we shall overcome someday black and white together black and white together Black and white together, black and white together, someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. The truth, the truth shall make us free. The truth shall make us free. The truth shall make us free. Someday, oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday.